Welcome to this video from the P-Way Engineer. In this video we will be looking at what is known as S and C. Track engineers tend to divide the track into two categories, plane line and S and C. Knowing the difference is important, as rules and regulations for each in terms of design, inspection, and construction differ. So, what do we mean when we say S and C? S and C stands for switches and crossings. Switches and crossing are the components that allow trains to change lines and routes as part of junctions or cross other lines. Without S and C the railway would be a single line that linked two points together. S and C allows railway lines to be linked together, joining multiple routes and giving greater operational flexibility. I hope you can now see how important S and C is to the railway. However, along with this importance does come risk. Moving trains from one line to another, moving a wheel from rail to rail has its risks. As well as bringing huge benefits to the railway, S and C is also an area where derailments are likely to happen if the correct controls are not in place. As the name suggests S and C is made up of switches and crossings. There is a lot to both switches and crossings, in terms of construction type, design types as well as the subcomponents that make up them both. In this video, we will give an overview and starting point on S and C. For more in-depth videos, please check out and subscribe to the channel. If you don't find a video covering the topic you are after, please drop a comment below with the video you want to see, and I will try to make it happen. Thank you. So, let's dive into a bit more detail on the different parts that make up S and C. First up, switches. Switches are the movable sections of rail, that allow trains to be directed between two routes or tracks. Switches are a key area where signaling and track disciplines meet. Signaling equipment called Points Operating Equipment, or POE, is used to move the switches. Other equipment, known as detection, is used to ensure that the switches are fully closed in either position. This is key to avoid trains derailing when traveling over sets of switches. When we talk about switches, we refer to them as sets. A pair of switches is known as a full set. A half set is one switch. It is common that half sets are replaced individually as, and when issues or defects arise. When we talk about switches we often refer to left and right hand sides. But how do we know which is which? The answer is to stand at the front of the switches. The half set on your left, is the left hand half set. The half set on the right, the right hand half set. Switches have a number of parts to them, which each have a name and a function. Let's take a tour of a switch, the different parts and what they do. Firstly, the stock rail. The stock rail refers to the fixed rail on each half set. It is welded into the track at either end and is secured by base plates through the switch's length. It is a full section of rail, apart from through the area where the switch rail contact, here some machining may have been done to ensure the switch can sit flush to the stock rail. Next up, the switch rail. The switch rail is the part of the half set that moves. It is on the switch rail that the wheel transfers between the two rails. To allow this to happen, the switch rail has a reduced profile at the start, that gradually increases through its length until it reaches a full rail section. The inspection and maintenance of the switch rail profile is a critical maintenance activity to avoid trains derailing. For much of its length, the switch rail is free. It is not clipped down like normal rails and the stock rail. It sits on special base plates that either have lubricated sliding surfaces, slide chairs, or rollers to facilitate its smooth movement between positions. Because of this free movement, switch blades can become damaged easily if the sleepers underneath are voiding. Each end of the switch rail is known by a different name. 
the switch toe is at the plain end of the switch. When looking into a set of switches, they are the first part of the switch you will come to. A key part of switch design is protecting the toe. This is for a number of reasons, but a key one is striking the toe drastically increases the likelihood of the switch being split, where the wheel pushes the switch rail away from the stock rail, leading to trains being on the wrong track and ultimately derailing. At the opposite end of the switch to the toe, is the switch heel. At the heel we have heel blocks. These blocks join the stock and switch rails together, normally with high tensile bolts. At the heel blocks, we can also see the radius of the different routes. Given that both switch rails are free, unlike the stock rails, how is the gauge maintained? The gauge is maintained through the use of stretcher bars. These hold the switch rails the correct distance apart, and ensure that when the switches are swung, both switch rails move in tandem. The longer the switch, the more stretcher bars are required. There are two dimensions that are important when it comes to switches, these are the switch length and the radius. The length of the switch is measured from the end of the stock rail, at the front of the switch, to where the switch panel ends after the heel blocks. It is expressed as a letter, with the shortest switch denoted as an A switch, right up to the longest switches, H switches. The shorter the switch the tighter the radius the turnout has, although the exact radius depends on the overall track design on site. As short switches have tighter radius, the speed at which a train is allowed to traverse the turnout route is low. H switches, with their longer lengths and large turnout radii are suitable for the highest speeds. Switch length and radius are key drivers in the overall layout and footprint of railway junctions. Check out the channel and video description for further videos on the different railway junction configurations. So now we have an understanding of switches, let's look at the second part of S and C, crossings. The main function of, and reason we have crossings in track, is that they allow a train wheel traveling along a rail, to pass through the rail of another track that is crossing its path. Even in a simple turnout, one rail has to cross another, requiring one crossing. The more complex a junction layout gets, the more crossings are required. In this section we will look at Names of areas and parts of a crossing the two design types of crossings, the different crossing construction types, and crossing angles. Before we dive deep into crossings, let's look at some of the parts of crossings and their names. This will help with explanations in later sections. Where names are specific to certain crossing construction type or obtuse crossings, we will cover them when we talk specifically about those type of crossing. The V is the area where the two rails that are crossing over each other, join. This can take a few different forms, depending on how the crossing is constructed, but we will cover this later. Next up is the crossing nose. This is the end of the V, where two rails taper down to a point. It also tapers off in height. This helps avoid damage as wheels transition over it. Wheels run off or onto the nose, depending on the direction of travel, as they go through the wheel transfer area. More on the wheel transfer area in a second. Another key thing to remember about the nose of the crossing, is measurements, such as the leg lengths, taken from the crossing nose. The wing rails are either side of the V. The space between the wings and V is known as the flange way. This is, as the name suggests, the area the wheel flange passes through. The wing rails help, along with the check rails on the opposite rails, guide the train wheel and ensure it stays on the rail. Next up is the wheel transfer area. The wheel transfer area is the running surface of the crossing, where the train wheel transfers from the wing rail to the crossing V, or vice versa. In this area the wheel goes unsupported for a distance. 
it is then picked up again by the opposite side of the crossing. This means that, especially in crossings with poor surrounding track condition, that the parts of the crossing in the wheel transfer area are susceptible to damage. The neck, or knuckle, is the narrowest space between the wing rails. This is in front of the crossing V. Now we know a few of the areas, and parts of crossings, we can look at the two main types of crossing. Crossings fall into two design types. Common and obtuse. It is important to be able to tell the difference between the two. Let's take a look at the first crossing type, common crossings. Common crossings get their name from the fact that they appear in all types of S and C layouts. They are also known as acute crossings. This is because, if we were to draw two lines, one on each rail a train could be taking, like the ones here in red, they form an acute angle. An easy way to spot a common crossing, is that they have one nose. Next up is the obtuse crossing. Obtuse crossings appear in one place, as part of a fixed diamond layout. This is found when one line is crossing another. It is formed of two obtuse crossings and two common crossings in, yes you guessed it, a diamond shape. Obtuse crossings always appear in pairs, sitting opposite each other in track. Similar to the acute crossing, the obtuse crossings get their name from the fact that the lines drawn, representing the rails a train would travel on, form an obtuse angle. Obtuse are also distinctive from common crossing, as they have two crossing noses. Rather than Vs, they have point rails. This is because the nose is formed from one rail. It is pretty common to see an obtuse crossings with an integrated check rail, this is because the crossings are directly opposite each other, so there is nowhere to mount a check rail conventionally. This is known as a raised check. So now we know about the two different types of crossings, let's look at the different ways crossings are constructed. First up is the fabricated crossing. Sometimes these are also called built or made up crossings. This is the cheapest style of crossing to manufacture. The crossing is constructed from four pieces of rail, that are suitably bent and machined, then drilled and bolted together with high tensile steel bolts. Multigroove locking pins, or MGL pins, can also be used. Spacing blocks are used to create the flangeways in the crossing. The crossing nose is formed by two of the pieces of rail, one known as the point rail, the other as the splice rail. The point rail forms the actual top of the crossing nose. The splice rail joins the point rail back a little from the nose. You can see the join on the crossing. Damage to the crossing in this area can be hard to weld repair because of the joint between the two rails. Whilst built-up crossings are cheaper and quicker to make, they are also significantly weaker due to the number of number of parts, the holes drilled to connect them and the fastenings used. This can lead to faster deterioration compared to other crossing types, as well as limits on where they can be used. In the UK the use of built-up crossings is limited to track that has a lower speed and tonnage, as well as sidings. Another limitation for built-up crossings is that, due to the way they are constructed, they are not strong enough to be stressed, therefore are normally jointed into track. The presence of joints can lead to track geometry faults, such as dip angles and voiding. Next up is the part fabricated crossing. Although there are two different subtypes of part fabricated crossing, they both follow the same general principle. In a part fabricated crossing, the V is one piece, rather than two, as in a built-up crossing. This is achieved by either electro-slag welding the point and splice rails together in the manufacturing plant, or by the use of a cast V. This is known as a cast center block crossing. To this V, wing rails are then bolted, in a similar fashion to in a built-up crossing. 
Part fabricated crossings are stronger than a standard built-up crossing, which allows them to be used in CWR track, as well as higher usage and tonnage lines. Lastly, we have the cast crossing, also known as a monoblock crossing. In this type of construction, the crossing is cast as a single item, hence the term monoblock. Monoblock crossings are cast from a steel alloy, or stenitic manganese steel, or AMS for short. AMS has good anti-wear properties, high tensile and impact strength compared to the normal grade steel used for standard rails. These properties increase over time, as the metal is what's known as work hardened. Work hardening is when a metal is strengthened by hammering, rolling, or another form of mechanical process. In the case of a railway, crossing work hardening is done by the wheels of trains passing over it. This does take time, and can lead to uneven hardening. To give a level of work hardening prior to installation in track, the crossing can be explosive depth hardened. This process involves laying and blanket of plastic explosive across the running surfaces of the crossing, then detonating it. This causes localized deformation that work hardens the metal, creating hardened material that is better equipped to withstand the passage of train wheels. As the mono-block crossing is a single piece, it removes one of the major drawbacks of the fully and part-fabricated type crossing, the weakness created by the bolting together of the components. This means that AMS monoblock crossings are the crossing used in the higher speed and tonnage lines. They do, however, have some drawbacks and limitations. Firstly, AMS cannot be directly welded to the normal grade steel. To solve this a small stainless steel insert is welded between the AMS and normal grade steels. This is completed at the manufacturer rather than on site. Defects in this area are tricky to weld repair, given the three different metal types within a small area, and often the weld repairs fail. Monoblock crossings are also expensive, given the manufacturing processes involved as well as having long lead times. This means that any issues with them, such as cracks or defects, that cannot be weld repaired can be awkward for the maintainers. This often leads to spare crossings being ordered and stored for critical junctions. While the construction type is important to the performance of the crossing when it is in track and trains are running over it, a track design engineer will pay closer attention to an important figure when looking at a junction layout and the choice of crossing they will use. This figure is the crossing angle. The crossing angle is a critical geometric parameter that in simple terms is used to describe the angle at which the two running rails cross one another at the crossing. We have already seen that this angle is important when determining if a crossing is of the common or obtuse type. Rather than be expressed as an exact angle in degrees, crossing angles are expressed in the form of a ratio, 1 in n. So for example a 1 in 8 crossing would have a gap of 1 meter between the running edges of the rails, 8 meters back from the intersection point. The larger the number, the shallower the crossing angle. The intersection point, or IP is the point where the lines we place over our running lines cross. However, it would be both impossible to manufacture a crossing with a nose this fine, and also impractical, given it would break easily due to being so thin. As you can see from the picture the crossing nose is blunt. A crossing nose is normally 16 mm wide at this point. This allows it to perform its function while also being constructible and maintainable. The true mathematical intersection point can be found using the crossing angle. The intersection point is a distance 16 times the crossing angle in front of the crossing nose. The crossing angle is important, as along with the switch length and radius, it determines the overall footprint of the S and C layout. It also feeds into the speed that trains can be allowed to pass over a junction, an important factor in the overall performance of the railway. The shallower, or flatter, the crossing angle the faster the speed that can be attained across it. However, this then requires longer switches with larger turnout radius which in turn increases the overall size. On a new build railway, 
a track design engineer may have the luxury of being able to pick any size of switch and crossing combination to suit the speed and operational profile they have been remitted to deliver. However when upgrading existing layouts, often with a view to modernize them, space can be at a premium. This can lead to an exercise in trying different crossing angles and switch lengths in the area to see what can be achieved. So if we are on site, looking at a crossing, how do we determine the crossing angle? The first port of call should be to inspect the crossing all over. It is usual to have the crossing angle on the crossing somewhere. In a fabricated crossing, it is often on the blocks used for construction. On a cast crossing, the angle is normally noted on the side, along with other details, including a unique number for that casting. If, for some reason, the angle cannot be found on the crossing anywhere, it can be determined on site by measuring. There are a number of ways to obtain the crossing angle by measuring, with each country having a preferred method. Some rely on the use of the intersection point, which is not always practical on site. It is important to remember that the crossing angle is a ratio, which is the same along the length of the crossing. So, we take a measurement between the running edges behind the V, and find where the edges are 50 mm apart, and mark that point. Then we need to find the point where the edges are 150 mm apart, and mark there also. Then we measure the distance between the two points, down the center line of the crossing and remembering to use millimeters still. The distance between the two marks is then divided by the change in the spread of the crossing legs, in this case 100 mm. For this example, let's say that the distance in between our two marks, x, is 1075 mm. The change in spread of the legs is 100 mm. 1075 divided by 100 gives us 10.75. Therefore this crossing has an angle of 1 in 10.75. This method works well if the places the measurements are taken on the crossing need to be tweaked for some reason, for example if the edge-to-edge -edge measurement is taken at 150 mm and 250 mm. It can also be used when the measurements are taken in inches. Well, there we have it, an introduction to switches and crossings. You now know about the parts of both switches and crossings, the different types and constructions of crossings, as well as how to determine the crossing angle. While we have covered a lot within this video, there is a lot more to learn about S and C, as well as the rest of the railway. If you have found this video interesting and useful, which I really hope you have, please give it a like and drop a comment down below. To find out more, Pop over to the channel where you will find lots more content, covering all parts of the railway. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the new videos as they drop. Also, please head over to the website to find our shop.